So in this video I will explain how to present the results of thematic analysis. And while doing so I will also talk about common uh, mistakes that students uh, make when presenting their themes and uh, common challenges that they face. Importantly, in this video I will not be talking about uh, the whole structure of the results chapter or how, uh, how to organize and structure that chapter because that's something I address in another video. In this video I just want to focus uh, strictly on uh, the language of uh, talking about the theme. So how do, we, how do we present our individual themes to the reader? So let's just jump straight uh, into my five pieces of advice for how to present themes. So number one is always make sure that uh, there is enough evidence from the data. Make sure there is enough evidence from the data. So when you talk about themes, when you introduce uh, a given theme, when you talk about it, when you discuss it, just make sure that it's not all based on, on what you are saying, but there is actually evidence from your data. By evidence, of course, I mean quotes. So that's, uh, as I'm sure you've seen in, in many published articles, maybe other theses that you, uh, that you read, uh, it's an essential part of presenting the results of qualitative data analysis in general. So presenting your themes. There has to be, there have to be quotes, both be, uh, because they are interesting and also because this is the evidence. Don't let, uh, don't force the reader to simply trust, uh, trust you that these things happened or your participants talked about these things, but rather give them evidence, show them uh, what your participants really said. This, of course, uh, positively influences the validity of your findings as well, because this is, again, this is the evidence. This shows that uh, your participants really said something. So this shows me as a reader that, uh, in fact, this is what they meant. So, so I know that you didn't just jump into uh, conclusions. You didn't just uh, overinterpret what your participants said because the evidence is right there. So you're showing me the extracts. I can see, I can analyze them myself and evaluate them my myself and see that this in fact happened. And a common mistake, of course, is uh, not enough of this evidence. So sometimes I see interesting uh, sections or chapters uh, the students uh, talk about their themes, they talk about their findings, but the problem is that I do not know uh, where exactly all of this is coming from. So uh, so there are no extracts, there is no mention of, of how many people said something, so it's basically just talking about something that's interesting in theory, but I really don't know how you came to that conclusion. So as I said, uh, ways to provide that kind of evidence, of course, is through quotes and also through uh, some numbers, some indication of uh, whether this was a, a dominant view, whether it was one person who said it, or whether it was everybody who said it, or most of my participants. So this, of course, relates uh, to the topic of using numbers in qualitative uh, results, which is uh, not without controversy. So you can have a look at uh, one of my previous videos in which I answer your questions, and I answer the question of how I feel about using numbers in qualitative research. But I just, uh, in short, I do support this idea of using numbers because this is another evidence. This shows the reader what really happened in that data. And the second important element is a balance between quotes and your voice. So this is uh, another extreme. So one extreme, one common mistake is when, as I just said, students uh, fa fail to provide any ev evidence from their data. So they won't use any quotes from the data. They won't use any numbers. And the other extreme is quite the opposite. So they over rely on quotes, but there is not enough of their own voice. There's not enough of their own voice. So, uh, so all I'm seeing is just one quote after another. There is hardly any explanation of these quotes. So, so, so the student would just be throwing one after another, one, one quote after another, showing me these long quotes. I have no idea what they are. I have no idea where exactly to look at in these quotes. So, so basically I'm, I'm lost as a reader. So basically uh, a rule is that if you are, firstly, if you're using quotes, you need to explain to the reader what uh, the following quote is about. So don't just say, uh, you know, Mary said, and then provide this whole long quote or, you know, John or Michael or whatever said this, and then jump uh, straight into the next quote. Uh, explain what uh, the reader is about to read basically. So, you know, say that, uh, a common view was that 
I don't know, the, the English lessons were too difficult. And then provide a quote or a common view was that less English lessons were too difficult. And this is evident in the following quote from this and that interview. Then before moving on to the next quote, explain, for example, uh, Mary uh, shared a similar view when she reflected on how she felt about group work and then provide a quote. So basically, uh, tell me when I, if I'm, a, I'm the reader, tell me what I'm about to read. Tell me why I'm reading that quote. So, uh, so that's one thing. And second thing is that there generally needs to be your voice. So after the quote, uh, ideally, I also want to have uh, see some transition before you move on to the next quote. I want to see some transi uh, transition. I want to read about your data. I want to understand your data. So help me understand your data. Uh, there is a limit to, there is no rule for that, but there is a limit definitely for how many quotes to use. So you don't want to be using, I would say, uh, more than two or three per page. That would be a lot. And also each quote should not be too long. If it's very long, then indicate maybe in bold or, or in italics uh, how, uh, what exactly you want me to read, what exactly you want me to pay attention to. So again, don't, don't leave me just guessing why this quote is here. So that's that's an important thing. There should be uh, explanation. I will come back to it. It will be one of my points uh, that I'm about to discuss, but also it's, it just should be your voice in there, not just the quote. So as I said, evidence is important, but your voice, what does it mean? Keep explaining what does this quote mean and what you have found, what you know about this uh, this theme or sub theme. Then uh, number three is focus on one theme or one sub theme at a time. So focus on one theme or one sub theme at a time. Uh, when you are introducing a given theme or sub theme, uh, just talk about this single, the single element of your data, the single finding. So, uh, as I said, provide quotes, provide some discussion. Just but make sure that we are uh, in one. We are looking at one theme at a time. So. Just to give you an example, if you are doing a study of, uh, let's say, some classroom dynamics or teaching techniques, and you were talking about uh, strategies that uh, that teachers are using in classroom. So one of these strategies is uh, to give students enough autonomy, to, uh, to give students a lot of autonomy. So they, they can decide there is a, a teaching approach that... Uh, argues for this kind of uh, autonomy so the students can decide what what they do in their own time and what they do in their in their groups or individually so so that's one of the techniques so you're talking to me as a reader i'm i'm learning uh, about this this theme so or sub theme let's say if the main theme is uh, teaching techniques the sub theme is provide enough autonomy i'm i'm reading about this and i don't want to be a common mistake that students make is that as they go through that, uh, that sub theme, uh, student autonomy or providing students with autonomy, they will uh, talk about this a little bit. And then I don't even know when. So, so they will make a, a, a seamless transition to talking about challenges. So let's say they will talk about, uh, they will throw a couple of extracts about autonomy. And then they will say, this teacher uh, noticed that this can be a problem because uh, students don't have guide, uh, guidance as to what to do or students uh, don't focus on what they are supposed to be focusing on. They, they start playing with their phones, for example. So as a reader, I'm uh, and, and then to make things worse, uh, by the time I get uh, to the end of this discussion, so I'm assuming, OK, maybe you, you made a transition to talking about barriers or challenges or whatever. But then uh, as I finish that section, I'm uh, I'm surprised to find that the next section is about barriers or challenges uh, of certain teaching approaches. So then I'm completely confused because I feel like we're going in circles because I, I thought I just read about certain challenges. I just read that students won't focus and they will do their own thing. So, so that's, of course, this is not good. As I will explain in the final point, this is not good. You don't want your reader to be confused. So what happened there exactly and how to fix it? So as I said, you want to be focusing on one sub theme or one theme at a time. So talk about uh, providing the students with autonomy as one of the teaching approaches, then move on to the next teaching approach or whatever, and then uh, only then start you know, a new section in which you talk about any challenges. And now uh, I understand that this may be, this challenge may be very strongly related to and linked to this particular teaching approach. And this is good because as I'll explain in a second, there have to be links between themes and uh, sub themes. So, so this is good and I understand that you want to mention that but what would be more effective is if you simply 
a signpost to wherever you talk about this in detail. So you can be talking about uh, providing students with autonomy and then you may just tell me in brackets uh, for a more uh, or however for discussion of uh, challenges related to that autonomy see section 3. So I will know already there were certain challenges but for now I can as a reader again I can uh, stay focused on this particular theme. Before I continue I just wanted to quickly thank my sponsor for today which is rev.com. Rev.com is a transcription uh, company transcription service. Uh, it's a very accurate one and the reason it's, uh, why it's accurate is because there are humans doing the transcription. This is very important. As a data analyst uh, I noticed incre an increasing trend in using automated, automated services and uh, the risk of that is that uh, quite often the transcriptions are not very accurate. So this is to me it's a very important, this is a very important point that there are actually humans doing the transcription. So their tr transcriptions are very accurate and uh, I wouldn't uh, recommend them if I if I never use them. So I use them and I tested them and I can confirm that uh, the quality of the transcripts is uh, an extremely good one. So if you ever wonder uh, what kind of services uh, to use, of course, if you're not doing the transcriptions yourself, which is something I actually recommend doing, if you ever wonder which company to choose, uh, there is a link be uh, below this video, you can click it. It is an affiliate link, so I will be acknowledged and rewarded if you click in that link and use their services. So this, uh, as I said, leads to another uh, piece of advice, uh, which is to have links between themes and sub-themes. So don't just discuss them uh, separately. Another, 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 another mistake. Another, another, another mistake uh, that I that I often uh, see is uh, is just this uh, disconnect between different themes and sub-themes. So so. Uh, I'm just reading about one theme or sub theme and then I'm reading about another and then I'm reading about another and then after a while I, I have to scroll all the way to the beginning of the document where hopefully uh, you uh, you have some table or some diagram where all themes are presented because I'm beginning to again feel confused and lost. I'm not sure uh, whether how they are related, why are we talking about this theme, where exactly are we, are we under this main theme or that main theme. So basically you're not helping me you're not providing links between these different themes and sub-themes. As I just explained, uh, these links can be uh, in the form of signposting. So uh, so if you're on one theme or sub-theme and it relates to another, then just say, you know, uh, for a more detailed discussion of challenges, see section three. And then as you move uh, to section three, also don't forget to link back to the previous theme. So in section three, if you talk about uh, challenge, a specific challenge of student autonomy, then again say that as noted in section two, student autonomy, providing students with autonomy was one of the strategies that helped. However, there were also a number of challenges. So in this section, I will review these challenges. So that's obviously uh, in general, in academic writing, this is a rule. You have to link between sections as well. So that's, that's important. But then as you go through individual themes and sub-themes, also whenever there is any link, just help the reader understand that, that link. So uh, quite often we see if we have challenges and benefits of something. So uh, let's say we're talking about online ed education and uh, I have just discussed benefits and then I'm talking about challenges. Then again, j just make links whenever there are related challenges and benefits. So for example, if we're talking about online education and you discussed a, a benefit of not having to commute, so not having to spend money on bus, for example, bus fares. Uh, however, there is a challenge that says uh, there is no opportunity to go out and, and I don't know, socialize and generally uh, get out of your house. So, so when you get to that challenge, explain that as noted in section two, one of the benefits was that uh, you don't have to you don't have to take a bus to school. You can it's convenient. You can stay at home. However, this was also at the same time it was a challenge for some people. Maybe say how many uh, because they they lack socialization. They lacked contact with others. So so basically, this kind of links just always uh, make sure if there is any link, make sure uh, to to explain how this linked. And here I don't really uh, mean because another thing I notice is. And students quite often are anxious because they, they learn that there have to be relationships between themes and quite often they ask me how do I check these relationships 
Um, remember that this is qualitative research. So in quantitative research, relationships are in fact, uh, there, there is a way to uh, determine and provide evidence of strong or weak relationship between different factors, different, different uh, values, let's say. In qualitative research, the, the concept of relationship is quite different and it's a very tricky one. So, uh, so I would be very cautious even talking about relationships. You can uh, indicate very subtly that uh, this refers or relates to another, another theme, but I'll be careful talking about a strong uh, relationship, just like you don't want to be talking about a correlation. So that's, uh, I would say, a, bo a bonus uh, extra advice and extra challenge in this video is that sometimes I hear a quantitative language and qualitative results. So you don't want to be talking about correlations and uh, you want to be very careful about when talking about relationships. And now finally, uh, the final advice and a couple of challenges uh, and some things that has been emerging throughout th this video, I hope is uh, generally make sure uh, there is a smooth narration. There is clarity and there is smooth nar narration. Uh, as I often say, uh, presenting the results of thematic analysis of qualitative research is uh, like, a, like a narrative. It's like a story. It's like telling the reader a story. So you do want to ensure that it's a smooth and nice and clear story. Again, it links to what I said before, for example, to lack of links between sections and, and themes, uh, to, to this lack of clarity to either too many or not enough quotes, to being descriptive. I know one of you asked me in, in, uh, in the comments, what does this mean? So basically being descriptive is just uh, saying, just like I said, if you lack, if, if the discussion lacks your voice and you're just throwing the extracts at me and just showing me, he said this and she said this and, and, and they said this. So basically this is being descriptive. There is no, uh, as a reader, I'm asking, so what? So what does it? What does it tell me? You never told me whether it's important, whether it's interesting, whether it's similar to something else. This is being descriptive. Just, just not enough of of your, I would say, of your voice. Not enough of clarity. So again, as I said, it should be a clear and easy to follow, and enjoyable story, uh, which means that uh, there is there is one piece of advice that I always give to my students, when uh, writing your results. Always imagine that your reader will be somebody potentially uh, tired, somebody potentially uh, not very intelligent, and, and somebody uh, who's potentially quite irritated and frustrated with reading uh, this chapter. Why do we want to assume that? So if you think about it that way, so they are, they are quite tired, they're slow in general, and they're not very intelligent, it really helps to think about them this way because then you remember that you, you have to keep rem uh, reminding them everything, keep uh, pointing them to where things are in the chapter, keep explaining. So, you know, as noted in section 3.2, as noted in table, as evident in table 1, on page this or that. So, uh, as I said, links between sections, as explained in the previous section, as the next section will explain. So just keep showing them everything. Don't ever assume they will remember what you said on the previous page. Don't ever assume they will remember what table, you know, uh, on page five uh, demonstrated. Just always make sure that uh, you clearly show them where things are. They can very quickly navigate uh, your chapter because in fact, they probably are tired. In fact, they probably are tired. They, they are frustrated because uh, if you're marking assignments, if you're marking thesis or dissertations, it's not like you can focus on one uh, a day, for example. Quite, it's quite common that you have 15 or 20, let's say, master dissertations to review. And, and believe me, uh, it is uh, true that the person is tired. So, and it's not fair, but it's, but it's true that you become irritated and frustrated. So, and you start to assume that the student's writing is not good just because you're tired. So as a student, just, uh, you want to avoid that. You want uh, them to see clearly what you found and, and really, you know, recognize your findings. So just make sure to point them to everything uh, constantly. So I hope that uh, you learned something new from this video. If you did, please like the video, consider subscribing if you haven't yet. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. And if you feel that you still require a more detailed assistance, feel free to reach out and ask me about one-to-one -one lessons.